Welcome again to worship at Front Royal Presbyterian. We're so glad you're here with our open doors. We have open hearts. We have open minds. We are welcoming you. If you are new to joining us, a special welcome to you as a visitor. Please make yourself known in the chat section so that we can just say hi and let you know how thankful we are that you're worshiping with us today. I have a few announcements that I'm just going to highlight. The first of which is today is Outreach Sunday which means that after you hear the benediction, you walk to your car keys, you pick them up, you get in your car, you drive to the church, and you come and you get a basket of food and you deliver it. And you can see that we've got some supplies back here. So I'm really hoping that you will just take maybe 30, 45 minutes, pop over to the church and help us deliver food to those that are hungry within our community. And those reach bags actually go to people that are isolated. And, and can't get to the grocery store due to a disability or age. So we're um, really, they're depending on us. Last son, last month, we only had one couple. So I'm hoping that we will just prove that all wrong and overflow this community with food and love on Sunday. Um, next week, we will be having communion. Um, it's also All Saints Sunday. And if you've been with us for a while, you know that we light candles and we remember those that have passed away in the past year. If you've lost a loved one, a friend, we invite you to please send their name to Misty or myself so that we can include them in worship. Say their name and recognize that God recognizes the saints and has received them into the company of light. This church has a very long history with St. Luke's Community Clinic. And Wednesday at six o'clock, there will be an annual meeting, and that is via Zoom. So that annual meeting is something where we tell you the state of the clinic. And so I'd invite you, if you'd like to, to ask me for that Zoom link so you can tune in and hear what's going on at St. Luke's and how they're responding in this time of crisis because they are really reaching out to the community and doing some phenomenal things. Finally, we need some volunteers this week. We have some exciting stuff to do in terms of stewardship. So I need some help packing some bags on Wednesday at two o'clock. And then I need some help delivering those packages and that can be on your own time frame, Thursday and Friday. No contact, completely safe. The more volunteers we get, the more people we can tell the good news of what's going on here at Front Royal Presbyterian. So I hope that you will reach out and volunteer just a little bit of your time to help us out with that. Thank you to Dee for assisting with liturgy this morning. And of course, Misty and Heather, now let us worship the Lord our God. Is the church. When I think of the church, it is more than a brick and mortar institution. It is the people of God being the hands, feet, and face of God to this world. 
A few years ago, I wrote a hymn to celebrate our last church's 175th anniversary, and the first verse sums it up nicely. More than bricks and mortar standing in this place, let us be his hands, let us be his face. Lord, please lead us onward as we turn the page, shining bright with God's true light through the coming age. Let it be so. Please join me in the call to worship. Some people boast about their fancy cars and newfangled gadgets, but we, the people of God, we boast in the name of the Lord. Some people place their faith in possessions, bank accounts, and worldly success. But we, the people of God, we place our faith in Jesus Christ. Some people see only the outward appearance, the labels, and the fancy shoes. But we, the people of God, we see the inner heart. When we see any of God's creations, we see a child of God. Some people would say that church is a waste of time, a collection of hypocrites. But we, the people of God, know that church is community, family, worship of our risen Lord, and a vision of the kingdom to come. So we come to worship today, setting aside all else, settling our minds on God alone, who creates and is still creating something new here in our midst. Let us worship the Lord together. Please join me in the prayer of confession. You call us and we find excuses not to respond. You have named us as your children and we still find our identity in the things of this world. You love us and we have chosen to turn away. You, in your radical generosity, became flesh and blood so that we might inherit eternity. And we are stingy and greedy and keep it all to ourselves. As much as we try to be the good stewards of this earth, our communities, our families, and of all that you have given us, we fail. Forgive us when we stumble. Forgive us when we become greedy. Forgive us when our words don't match our actions. And encourage us into a new way of living where we begin to model the radical generosity of your love. Hear now our prayers. For the assurance of pardon today, just as we remember that we have fallen from grace, that we have sinned and not lived into who God has called us to be, we also remember that these waters are life-giving, not only to us, but creation all around us. So, my friends, know that in the waters of baptism, you are forgiven and be at peace. Kids, it's Pastor Carrie, and I'm excited to be spending some time with you in our children's message. We are going to talk about our grateful chain, and we're going to get some answers for what you're grateful for today. But I also want to ask you what ways you like to support the church? What do you like to do to make the church a home for other people? I know that you guys have been sending letters to some of our members, and I can't even begin to tell you how many thank yous I've gotten from them. They love their coloring pages. You know, giving to the church isn't just when you give of your money. It's giving your time and your prayers and your love and who you are, your smiles. We like nothing better than to see you guys 
running down the sanctuary halls and into children's message. So I know we can't see you, but I hope you'll think about ways that you can support the church and love everybody because we're one big family. Now today, we're gonna continue with our grateful chain and I am grateful for this beautiful weather and that my windows at home get to be open and I got to go to sleep to the sound of an owl, which was really cool last night. Misty, what are you thankful for? I'm thankful for the, the weather and the changing of the leaves and our, our beautiful town that we live in. Yes, yes, and it's neat. It, the leaves are gorgeous and I love the fact that we're near Skyline Drive, but how about that track? Yeah. But, you know, I also think about, like, how cool is it that we live in an area where people drive, like, hours to come see where we get to see what we see every day? Yeah, absolutely. We need to remember how blessed we are. But, yeah, the traffic is on weekends. Yeah, you're better to walk. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for each one of our kids, for our church, for this beautiful weather. We ask your blessing on us as we continue to figure out who you would have us be in this new world in which we live. We thank you, Lord, for Skyline Drive and help us to remember that we are so blessed. Be with those that come to just sit in the awe of your beauty as they travel far and wide. Give them safe traveling mercies. And Lord, let your spirit be with them so that they know that you are the one that painted this beautiful landscape. Through your son's name, amen. Mm -hmm. Please join me now in the offering. God, in his extreme and radical love, became nothing so that we could have everything. By taking on flesh and blood, God gave up the sky and the stars and all he had created so that we might have a glimpse of what radical generosity is. Front Royal Presbyterian Church is a Matthew 25 church, which means we seek to live into those words that call us to feed the sheep, clothe the naked, offer rest to the stranger, heal the sick, and comfort the brokenhearted. We ask nothing more than you are able to give. We simply ask that you walk along this journey so that the church is not a building, but a community of believers transforming this world. There are many ways to give. Your financial gifts are only one way. Consider how God is calling you to generously give of yourself so that we might continue to be the church in the community and in the world. You may give online at tithe.ly.com or mail a check to the office. You may also check the website for a multitude of volunteer opportunities that are safe and little to no contact. I want to talk to you for a minute about generosity. When thinking of generosity at Front Royal Presbyterian, the synonym comes to mind for the word open-handedness. We have an open heart here and are continually giving of our gifts. We are generous with our time, our energy, and yes, even our funds. We are generous with our sharing in so many ways. We work together to promote backpack buddies in our school system to fight childhood hunger. We come together to feed our disadvantaged with the Dinner Together program. We work as a team with our mission support at St. Luke's, CCAP, and even the Compassion Closet. We are a family of generous people, and we are a family of open-handedness. During this countrywide shutdown due to COVID-19, we have continued to be generous with open hands to let out what is inside of Front Royal Presbyterian and share it with others. Embarking on that journey with them to wherever they need to go at the moment, listening, caring, is part of the opportunity of generosity. As a treasurer of this body, I have seen that generosity and I'm extremely overwhelmed at what we have done together this year. During this season of stewardship and as we continue to work together and we consider our pledges for 2021, I invite you to do so with generosity of heart, a mind of passion, and a hand of openness. Thank you. Let us pray. 
Lord, our gifts are but a little bit of all that you've given us. Just a little bit to work towards your kingdom. So use what we have, multiply it like you did loaves and fishes by the sea, and help us to be cheerful givers that give with the joy knowing that it is glorifying your name above all else. Amen. Our first reading is from the book of Psalms. Psalm 107, verses 1 through 22. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. He, his love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord tell their story. Those he redeemed from the hand of the foe, those he gathered from the lands, from east and west, from north and south. Some wandered into the wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way to a city where they could settle. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind, for he satisfies the thirsty and fills the hungry with good things. Some sat in darkness, in utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them from their distress. He brought them out of darkness, the utter darkness, and broke away their chains. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. For he breaks down gates of bronze and cuts through bars of iron. Some became fools through their rebellious ways and suffered affliction because of their iniquities. They loathed all food and drew near the gates of death. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He set out his word and healed them. He rescued them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his unfailing love and his wonderful deeds for mankind. Let them sacrifice thank offerings and tell of his works with songs of joy. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
As we go to God in prayer today, we have quite a prayer list to bring forward. First is Rachel Crumley, the former associate pastor here, and her family are recovering from COVID. I hear they're doing very well. The kids have been great, not that many symptoms, but Rachel and Paul apparently have had a little bit more of a difficult time. So we do pray for Rachel and Paul and the kids. We also pray for Lisa Venable this week. You may have heard that her nephew Brody um, died unexpectedly. Brody was 14 years old, immensely loved in this community, and a freshman in high school. So we keep the family in our prayers. Grief is never easy, but especially when it's unexpected and when it's a young person. Not just the family, but all of our community, and especially our teenagers, as they navigate this world of grief. We also remember in our prayers, Eugene Albrecht, a friend of mine, his father was diagnosed with a brain tumor and is in a great deal of pain and um, is, is going to be received by God into the kingdom in the next few weeks. With the world in the chaos in which we live, as we get closer and closer to the election, we pray for God's guidance. We know that scripture tells us that it is God who places rulers in our political offices for us. So we pray and have the faith that God, above all of us, is in control. Let us pray. Lord, there are so many sounds and smells around us. There's the fresh cut grass that is probably the last cut of the season. There's the leaves rustling in the trees that remind us of your spirit that moves even when we don't see it. There's busyness as people are coming to and from work and lunch. There's sirens as our first responders go about doing their job. There are birds that are singing your praises. And we give you thanks for this world as you have created it. As we all work together for the good of your will, not our own. Help us, Lord, as we are followers of your son, Jesus Christ, to put that first and foremost and set aside our differences, set aside our opinions, our selfishness. Help us to set aside all of those things that divide us so that we can be one united community and nation glorifying your name. And in these difficult times, Lord, we recognize that chaos is around us. You, O oh God, have reminded us that there is absolutely no place in the entire universe as we know it that you are not. Which means that even when we see chaos, Lord, you are among it and working. When, when we see death and, and, and starvation and hunger and war and disease, you are among it, Lord. There is no place that you can't be and that you won't go in order to redeem your children, in order to keep us safe. So Lord, in this world, as we get closer and closer to what is a very important election, we ask you, Lord, to give our leaders wisdom and courage. We ask you even today to, to prepare our next president to take that office, whether he is returning or he is coming back to as president, not vice president. We ask you, Lord, to give whoever you have proclaimed will guide us. Give them wisdom and courage and strength. Help them, Lord, to guide with that positive nature. And first and foremost, turning to you for answers. We give you thanks, Lord, for all of our community and especially our church today. Though we look so different, though we can't see one another's faces across the aisle, though virtual worship is not the same as, as coming in and giving hugs and handshakes and smiles and seeing the kids run down the, the, the aisles, Lord, we know that this is a way that we can tell the good news. So, Lord, we ask that those that are watching aren't just watching right now, but they are so radically changed by your message, so excited about your good news, so in love with the church that they can't help but share that in whatever way possible during this time of COVID. 
Help us, Lord, to, to step into that evangelistic mode. Don't let us be frightened of what others might think. Give us the power and the courage to do and be disciples, radically changing the world in which we live. And in that same vein, Lord, give all of our congregation and our community that wonderful feeling of comforting those that are grieving, offering your peace in the midst of that dark valley of the shadow of death, especially for Lisa Venable and her whole family. In a time of great uncertainty and, and, and death and grief, we ask you, Lord, to remind them that the cross is empty for each one of us and that cross is empty for Brody. So that Brody is now complete in his faith in you. And so we also pray for Eugene Albrecht, having lived a good life, having come to the end of his days, give him, Lord, that peace of mind that knows that you have him in your hands. And for his children and grandchildren, give them your presence. For those that are sick with COVID, Lord, those that are still struggling with this disease, whether it's isolation or illness or death or grieving, or those that are on our front line serving, Lord, help us to find answers. Work with our doctors and scientists so that vaccines are readily available, so that through your hand and not our own, um, our own wills, but through yours that we might come together as a community and fight this unknown among us, specifically for Rachel and Paul and the kids, specifically for any of those that are experiencing systems, symptoms like my niece, Sarah, and are feeling isolated from family. We thank you, Lord, for this church, for the opportunities to serve, Bless the food that our congregation members will serve and, and deliver to reach after service today. May it, may, not, may it be more than just a means of nourishment, but it may mean a physical and spiritual way that they know they are loved. All of these many things, Lord, we lift up to you. Because with the confidence of the children of God, we pray together the words that your son taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever, amen. The reading today comes to us from 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 12. I'm going to read from the Message Bible because I just love the way it reads. Hear now the word of the Lord. Remember, a stingy planter gets a stingy crop. A lavish planter gets a lavish crop. I want each of you to take plenty of time to think it over and make over up your mind what you'll give. That will protect against sob stories and arm twisting. God loves it when the giver delights in the giving. For God can pour on the blessings in astonishing ways, so that when you're ready for anything and everything, more than just ready to do what needs to be done. As one psalmist put it, he throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy and reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out. They never run out. This most generous God, who gives us seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals, is more extravagant with you. He gives you something you then can give away, which grows into full-formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way, producing with us praise to God. The prophet Isaiah tells us the grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of our Lord will stand forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, you speak to us in many ways. 
you speak to us through the birds singing, through the, the stars in the sky, through friends and loved ones, and through your word. So as we dive in and, and seek to find your message today, Lord, may these words be yours and bring glory to your name alone. Amen. The love of Jesus Christ always invites in. Agree or disagree? The love of Jesus Christ has always been one that overcomes divisions. Agree or disagree? The love of Jesus Christ is one that knows no boundaries. Agree or disagree? A love of Jesus Christ is one where there is a community without isolation. Agree or disagree? Now hold on to that because it's always been that way with the church. We overcome division with unity. We overcome hate with love. We overcome abandonment with welcome. And this is the mission of the church, to be the beloved community of God in this place in the world. Now, if you disagree with any of those, um, feel free to call me. And this is not a political statement, but I'm gonna use it as an illustration because I think it tells the radical nature of the church. There's a church in Ohio, and it's the church of my childhood youth minister. In 2017, they took in an undocumented woman and her child in order to avoid them being deported. The church offered them sanctuary. I don't know the details of her life. I don't know any of that, but I do know that today she is still in that sanctuary of the church, safe. So whether you agree or disagree with the politics of the church, and I I bring that up because it's, it's a radical one. Agree or disagree, that's not where we're going. The wonderful thing about that is that is supposed to define us. Not that they welcomed in an undocumented person, but that they stood up against the system. The love of Jesus Christ, think about those again, always invites in. It outwits the wise. It stands as a beacon to the world. And yes, sometimes it's controversial, but we overcome isolation. We proclaim that love overcomes hate and all boundaries are taken down. We as a church have a different mission than any other organization in the entire world. No other organization in the United States could offer sanctuary to an undocumented immigrant and get away with it. No other organization. ICE will enter homes. They will enter workplaces. But when it comes to a church, they take a second glance. They hesitate to enter a church. Not a political statement. But when you get to the point of that, it tells me that the church still has power. That the church is not just some archaic institution of years past that just sits in a place. But when we find a common mission, a common goal, and we radically move towards it. In that, the church is a radical place. And no other organization can stand up to the United States government and say, no, not here, not now. Whether it's with an undocumented immigrant or feeding the hungry, housing the homeless, the church is one institution that can radically change the world if we step into our mission. And I asked the elders, what is the church? What is the church? I'd love to hear your responses. Make a little video and send it to me. Upload it on the website. It's a great question. What is the church? We're actually defined as a nonprofit by the IRS, but we don't really fit the nonprofit status. We don't serve one single population 
like St. Luke's serves those that are in need of health care, or CCAP seeks to serve those that are hungry, or a pregnancy center seeks to serve those that are um, look, trying to raise a family or deal with a pregnancy. We don't serve one single population. We don't have an agenda. We don't have an advocacy position. Much like many of our organizations that are nonprofits, they would have some sort of advocacy position that would define them. We don't. We're different. We aren't really a business. We certainly don't turn a profit. We don't make widgets or gadgets or anything that we can sell. But we have to be transparent and accountable. So we're not really a business. What are we? What is our bottom line? All of these things have defined what we are not. But what are we? What is the church? The bottom line is that the church is the place that is radically training and equipping disciples to change hearts for God. That is our mission. Radically working within the world to change hearts for God. And the other strange thing about us is our membership. So much easier. If you're a member of the country club, you probably know that everybody's kind of in the same demographic. If you're a member of a homeowners association, you at least know where everybody lives. We as a church, we're this messed up family of God. We've got crazy aunts and uncles. We've got the one that, that hums her, to herself when she, she says the Lord's Prayer. We've got little children that are excited to run down the aisles. And then we've got those that snuggle up against their mom's knees because Pastor Harry is just too scary. We've got those that are the wisdom keepers. We've got those that are just fools for Christ. And to be honest, there's not one thing that defines us besides our love for Christ. To be honest, sometimes we don't really like each other, but we love each other. It's a crazy family. Our unique power of the church comes when we take that radical mission to follow Christ and take that into the world. That radical mission, which means that we can't just be sitting in our pews on Sunday morning it means that we have to be and do something, and sometimes we have to stand up to the big guy to get it to happen. Our job is to change hearts and equip you to take your faith beyond the walls. And we are failing if you are not doing just that. I'm going to say that again. Our job is to equip you to be a disciple in the world. We are not the United Way. We are not the Make-A-Wish Foundation. We're not the Sierra Club. We are trying to radicalize you in the love of Christ, and it is uncomfortable so that you will be changed and serve the world around you. And that's a tall order. When I thought of that, what's the biggest Starbucks drink? Venti Grande. That's a grande order, as Starbucks would say. It means living opposite the way of the world. It means that we have to choose against the grain sometimes. And it means that we give away, not to our own benefit, but to another's. And even more so than that, to God, giving away without counting the cost. Now, I'm standing in the garden, and no, I'm not stepping on any flowers, but I'm pretty sure the ivy's going to come back no matter what. All things is a weed. I love ivy because I'm preaching about a garden. British poet Samuel Coleridge once had a discussion with a man who firmly believed that children should be given the freedom to choose. So he was not going to give them a religious education growing up. He wanted them to choose for themselves the path before them. He wanted them to reach maturity and then decide if that is where they were to be. In good parable fashion, Coleridge did not disagree with them, he listened. And then a few weeks later, he invited him over to his house and he showed him his garden. And he looked at the garden and the man said, well, this isn't a garden, it's just weeds. To which Coolidge responded, you're nothing but weeds here, is that all you see? I didn't want to infringe upon the liberty of my plants. 
I didn't want to tell them which way to go. I didn't want to control it. I wanted to give the garden a chance to express itself. And it was just weeds. We as a church are not a bunch of weeds. We are being cultivated and grown in the beauty that God is creating us to be something so much more. And it takes that wonderful parable that we all know, the sower and the seed, that drives that message home. We know the parable of the sower and the seed. If you don't, go look it up. A gardener goes out to sow his seed, and he reaches into his bag, and he tosses the seed out in order to be grown. And when he tosses it, some of it falls on the rocky path, and that which falls on the rocky path will come up, but it doesn't have a root base, so when the sun comes out, it withers and dies. Some of that seed falls on the path, and the birds come and have a little feast. Some of that seed will go among the thorns and get choked out as it comes to rise to the sun. And yes, some of the seed is landed on good soil where it grows to be a glorious plant. And scripture tells us that that parable is where the word is landing with us. Are you rocky soil? Are you the thistles? Are you the good soil? Or are you the path? But this passage from 2 Corinthians suggests to me that there might be something else there. There might be something else, and it, it has something to do with my crazy gardening style. But the first thing I want you to remember is, in that parable, the sower is not stingy with his seeds. It's almost as if it's like Mary Poppins' magical bag and always reach in and there's always something else to come out. He's not stingy with his seeds. So my radical, I'll use that word, not that any of you gardeners are going to agree with me, way of planting bulbs is quite simple. I hate gardening. I dig a hole, maybe if I'm lucky, two and a half inches deep, take a handful of bulbs, not just one, maybe four or five, stuff them in as far as I can and I mush them down and then I cover the dirt over them and I go on to the next hole. And I do that every year, every single year. And sometimes, more than I probably know, the squirrels find them, and because they're like all of like two centimeters underground, dig them out and have themselves a feast. Sometimes they come up too early, like these bulbs are coming up, you know, and it's getting ready to get cold. Regardless of when they come up and what happens to my pathetic garden, I love to plant bulbs in my manner. And they do come up, and by the glory of God, they're come up and they nourish probably the deer more than the beauty of the earth, but I get to see them. My mother is coming this weekend. She has a plan. She's bringing bulbs with her. Do you know what she's gonna do? She is going to take her bulb planting and she's gonna put it down and measure to six inches. She will take one bulb out of the bag, put some water in the hole, put the bulb in the bowl. She'll probably give it a kiss and a prayer and sing it a song before gently putting the dirt back over it, watering it again, and moving on to the next one. I'm sorry, I can get mine done in like 10 holes for 100 bulbs. I'm not doing that 100 times. My way works, and I have fun with it. Her way works, and she enjoys it. Do you see where I'm going with this? There is no joy in giving the way someone else might give. You have to give the way that brings you joy. The end result is the same. The other key to the story is, much like the sower with that endless bag of seeds, there's a shortage of bulbs. I can go to Lowe's or Home Depot or anywhere and get more. Probably dig them up and divide them from somebody, from my mother's house. No, nope. I'm not stingy with the bulbs. I'm not going to painstakingly rid her down six inches because I don't enjoy that. I'm not gonna dig the perfect hole. I'm not gonna add the perfect amount of love but I'm also not gonna run out of seeds because God always provides. And this is the passage from 2 Corinthians. And I think this is a really great passage. So this is 2 Corinthians and um, I just read it, but I'm gonna read it again. He throws caution to the winds, giving to the needy and reckless abandon. His right living, right giving ways never run out. They never wear out. This most generous God who gives seed to the farmer that becomes bread for your meals is more than that extravagant with you. For he gives you something you then give away, which grows into full formed lives, robust in God, wealthy in every way, so that you can be generous in every way. 
producing with us. Praise to God. Generously giving, but the trick about that passage is it isn't to your own benefit. You don't get to choose exactly which bulb is going to grow and which one isn't. You have to give the glory to God because it's all about him, not about us. And this passage of scripture has been used totally wrong in the past. It is not a prosperity gospel. As much as I would love to tell you that if you give 50% of your income to the church, God will reward you tenfold with more income. That is not the gospel. The gospel is you give generously with a willing and joyful heart, and God will do what God will do. It's all about God, not about us. And that, my friends, is completely opposite about everything the world will tell you. Because the world tells you it's all about you. We get confused in the giving. And sometimes we might sell with a cheerful heart, but more often than not, we're counting the cost and looking to see what we need first. That giving to God is completely opposite of the ways of this world, and it's uncomfortable, and it's awkward. That church in Cleveland, right or wrong, stands by their mission. And they have protesters outside their doors day in and day out. Well, that's a little uncomfortable. There are those that have left the church and walked down the street to a less radical church. Well, that's awkward. Like I said, right or wrong, we have to choose a mission and we have to be radical about it and stick to it and be it and do it in the world. Radical in our generosity. And, and that means we don't count who's in and who's out. Let's take it one step further. That means that we don't get to ask for an income level or their welfare application before giving somebody a bite to eat or a cup of water. It means that we don't stingily store away food when others are going hungry. We give away generously because we remember that God will always provide. That's what the scripture says. Don't be afraid to give away. God will provide. And individually, myself included. It means we have to be careful when we find ourselves too often on the cautious side. Being careful, counting the cost. We have to sow generously, giving away without abandon, fully aware that some of it will fall on rocky and thorny soil. Fully aware that some of our gifts to this community will indeed be abused and taken advantage of. But that's okay. Because those that it reaches, it brings glory to God. God loves a cheerful giver. And in this crazy world in which we live, it needs to see us feeding and nourishing and beautifying the earth, not just with my silly bulbs, but with your love and our reaching out beyond our walls. That's why I plant bulbs with reckless abandon. See, now I have an excuse for it. Because I know that God's going to provide. I choose to see it as radically living into the trust that God will provide despite my efforts. That even when I fall short, God will complete the work that I started. Radically giving up control of things around us. And we all love control. Radically letting God step in in place of our doubts and concerns. Radically remembering that the church is not just some old archaic building, but it is a calling and it is a force to be reckoned with when we find our place in the world. This year I plan on still planting my bulbs and I'll enjoy it. I'll get a little frustrated when Sage comes along and thinks one's a tennis ball and runs away with it. This year also, Paul and I plan on giving radically. And we won't ask where, when, what, how, how much, which our finances are going to. We won't put conditions on it. We won't say that this is only meant for the choir. This is only meant for education. This is only meant if the church does this. We won't hold back so that we can place it in the offering plate in front of everybody when we reopen for worship. We won't put conditions on it that say certain things. 
and I hope you'll follow lead. Because we will quietly, joyfully, radically, and even when it all seems dark, because my friends, it does right now. Even when the little hole that we're in seems a little crowded because our houses seem that way right now. Even when the sun, what's well, sunning and shining right now, doesn't quite shine the way we want it to. We have faith that God will pick it up where we let it off. My friends, it is a generous God and he is good. We are blessed, we are the church. Go be the church, radically loving everybody around you and serving with abandon, without abandon. My friends, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. So Romans 16.5 says, greet the church that is in their house. Paul is referring to the church in their house not a church building, but a body of believers. Let me tell you a little story. Um, it's been, I don't know, four or five years ago. And you know how you just have one of those days where you have a thousand and one things to do and everything goes wrong that could go wrong. And then you remember you have one more thing to do. I was teaching a class the next day and I needed some lifesavers. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go to Walmart because Walmart has everything. Well, not this time. They did not, at the time, sell individually wrapped lifesavers in a bag. So I went to Dollar Tree. And, of course, Dollar Tree didn't have them either. So the last place I wanted to go was Target. That's where I ended up. So I go in and I get my two bags of lifesavers and a few other things because you can't go in Target and come out with just what you went in for. And when I get up to the line to register, there are three or four people in every line that was open. And that just added to my frustration. And I look over and there is a young man standing at an open register and he looks directly at me and says, ma'am, I can help you over here. And I thought, oh, thank goodness. So I go over there and I'm you know, getting stuff out of the basket and he starts ringing me up and I'm digging in my purse, my wallet, which you know always falls to the bottom. And he says, don't you just love lifesavers? And I'm like, yeah, and I'm still digging for my purse. And he says, no, really, he said, I just love lifesavers. They're wonderful. I love every flavor. They're just fantastic. And he was just going on and on. And I finally had to stop what I was doing and look at him and smile because he was just overjoyed about talking about lifesavers. And so I left and I got in the car and I was just like, wow. And I called my husband, I told him the story about my lifesaver. And I got home and I called Target and I wanted to know who the young man was because I wanted him thanked for making my day because he had just totally put a new perspective on it. So something he taught me that day, he gave me the gift of just stopping and enjoying the moment. And during this horrible time of COVID, we need to realize now more than ever that we are the hands and feet of Christ, that we do not have to worship inside a church. We just need to go out and be the church. Thank you. Let us affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
my friends. It is time for you to grab your keys and head over to church to deliver nourishment and love of Christ to those among us. Go be in the world, radically living into the calling of God, radically living into the mission and following the footsteps of Christ and knowing that the Spirit encourages you every step of the way. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. Thank you. 